The Hydrophobic Skunk by Irvin S. Cobb. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Hydrophobic Skunk. The Hydrophobic Skunk resides in the extreme bottom of the Grand Canyon and next to a southern republican who never asked for a federal office is the rarest of living creatures he is so rare that nobody ever saw him that is nobody except a native i met plenty of tourists who had seen people who had seen him but never a tourist who had seen him with his own eyes in addition to being rare he is highly gifted I think almost anybody would agree with me that the common, ordinary skunk has been the most richly dowered by nature. To adorn a skunk with any extra qualifications seems as great a waste of the raw material as painting the lily or gilding refined gold. He is already amply equipped for outdoor pursuits. Nobody intentionally shoves him around. Everybody gives him as much room as he seems to need. He commands respect, nay, more than that, respect and veneration wherever he goes joy riders never run him down and foot passengers avoid crowding him into a corner you would think nature had done amply well by the skunk but no the hydrophobic skunk comes along and upsets all these calculations besides carrying the traveling credentials of an ordinary skunk he is rabid in the most rabidissimus form he is not mad just part of the time, like one's relatives by marriage, and not mad most of the time, like an old-fashioned railroad ticket agent, but mad all the time, incurably, enthusiastically, and unanimously mad. He is mad, and he is glad of it. We made the acquaintance of the hydrophobic skunk when we rode down Hermit Trail. The casual visitor to the Grand Canyon first of all takes the rim drive, then he essays Bright Angel Trail, which is sufficiently scary for his purposes, until he gets used to it. And after that he grows more adventurous and tackles Hermit Trail, which is a marvel of corkscrew convolutions, gimleting its way down this red abdominal wound of a canyon, to the very gizzard of the world. Here, Johnny, our guide, felt moved to speech, and we hearkened to his words, and hungered for more, for Johnny knows the ranges of the northwest as a city dweller knows his own little side street. In the fall of the year, Johnny comes down to the canyon and serves as a guide a while, and then, when he gets so he just can't stand associating with tourists any longer, he packs his war bags and journeys back to the northern range and enjoys the company of cows a spell. Cows are not exactly exciting, but they don't ask full questions. A highly competent young person is Johnny, and a cowpuncher of parts. Most of the canyon guides are cowpunchers, accomplished ones too, and of high standing in the profession. With a touch of reverence, Johnny pointed out to us Sam Scoville, the greatest bronco buster of his time, now engaged in piloting tourists. Can he ride? echoed Johnny in answer to our question. Scoville could ride an earthquake if she stood still long enough for him to mount. He rode steamboat, not young steamboat, but old steamboat. He rode rocking chair, and he's the only man that ever did that and was not called on in a couple of days to attend his own funeral. We went on and on at a lazy mule trot, hearing the unwritten annals of the range from one who had seen them enacted at first hand. Pretty soon we passed a herd of burrows with mealy, dusty noses and spotty hides, feeding on prickly pears with rock lichens, and just before sunset we slid down the last declivity out upon the plateau and came to a camp as was a camp this was roughing it deluxe with the most deluxey vengeance here were three tents or rather three canvas houses with wooden half walls and they were spick and span inside and out and had glass windows in them and doors and matched wooden floors the mess tent was provided with a table and a clean cloth to go over it and there were china dishes and china cups and shiny knives forks and spoons bill was in charge of the camp a dark rangy good-looking leading man of a cowboy wearing his blue shirt and his red neckerchief with an air that johnny certainly could cook 
served on china dishes upon a cloth-covered table we have mounds of fried steaks and shoals of fried bacon and a bushel more or less of shepherded potatoes and green peas and sliced peaches out of cans and sourdough biscuits as light as kisses and much more filling and fresh butter and fresh milk and coffee as black as your hat and strong as sin how easy it is for civilized man to become primitive and comfortable in his way of eating especially if he has just ridden ten miles on a buckboard and nine more on a mule and is away down at the bottom of the grand canyon and there is nobody to look on disapprovingly when he takes a bite that would be a credit to a steam shovel despite all reports to the contrary i wish to state that it is no trouble at all to eat green peas off a knife blade you merely mix them in with potatoes for a cement and fried steak take it from an old steak eater tastes best when eaten with those tools of nature's own providing both hands and your teeth an hour passed busy yet pleasant and we were both gorged to the girls and had reared back with our cigars lit to enjoy a third jorum of black coffee apiece when johnny speaking in an off-hand way to bill who was still hiding away biscuits inside of himself like a parlour prestigidator said seen any of those old hydrophobies the last day or two not so many said bill casually there was a couple out last night pirating around in the moonlight i reckon though there'll be quite a flock of them out to-night a new moon always seems to fetch em up from the river both of us quit blowing on our coffee and we put the cups down i think i was the one who spoke i beg your pardon i asked but what did you say will be out to-night we were just speaking to one another about those hydrophobia skunks said bill apologetically this here canyon is where they mostly hang out and frolic round i laid down my cigar too i admit i was interested oh i said softly like that is it do they yes said johnny i reckon there's liable to be one come shoving his old nose into that door any minute or probably two they mostly travel in pairs sets as you might say you'd know one the minute you saw him though said bill they're smaller than a regular skunk and spotted where the other kind of is striped and they got little red eyes you won't have no trouble at all recognizing one it was at this juncture that we both got up and moved back by the stove it was warmer there and the chill of evening seemed to be settling down noticeably funny thing about hydrophobia skunks went on johnny after a moment of pensive thought mad you know what makes them mad the two of us asked the question together born that way explained bill mad from the start and won't never do nothing to get shut of it ahem they never attack humans i suppose don't they said johnny as if surprised at such ignorance why humans is their favorite pastime humans is just pie to a hydrophobia skunk it ain't really fun to be bit by a hydrophobia skunk neither he raised his coffee cup to his lips and imbibed deeply which you certainly said something then johnny stated bill you see he went on turning to us they aim to catch you asleep and they creep up right soft and take hold of you take hold of a year usually and clamp their teeth and just hang on for further orders some says they hang on till it thunders same as snapping turtles but that's the lie i judge because there's weeks on a stretch down here when it don't thunder all the cases i ever heard of they let go at sun-up it is right painful at the time said johnny taking up the thread of the narrative and then in nine days you go mad yourself remember that fellow the hydrophobia skunk bit down here by the rapids bill let's see now what was that hombre's name williams supplied bill heck williams i saw him at flagstaff when they took him there to the hospital that guy certainly did carry on regardless first he went mad and his eyes turned red and he got so he didn't have no real use for water well then prospectors don't never care much about water anyway and then he got to snapping and biting and foaming so they had to strap him down to his bed he got loose though broke loose i suppose i said no he bit loose said bill with the air of one who would not deceive you even in a matter of small details do you mean to say he bit those leather straps in two no sir he couldn't reach them explained bill so he bit the bed in two not in one bite of course he went on it took him several 
I saw him after he was laid out. He really wasn't no credit to himself as a corpse. I'm not sure, but I think my companion and I were holding hands by now. Outside, we could hear that little lost echo laughing to itself. It was no time to be laughing, either. Under certain circumstances, I don't know of a lonelier place anywhere on earth than that Grand Canyon. Presently, my friend spoke, and it seemed to me his voice was a mite husky. Well, he had a bad cold. You said they mostly attack persons who are sleeping out, didn't you? That's right, too, said Johnny, and Bill nodded in affirmation. Then, of course, since we sleep indoors, everything will be all right, I put in. Well, yes and no, answered Johnny. In the early part of the evening, a hydrophobia is liable to do a lot of prowling round outdoors. But toward morning, they like to get into camps. They dig under the side walls or come up through the floor. And they seem to prefer to get in bed with you. They're cold-blooded, I reckon, same as rattlesnakes. Cool nights always do drive them in, seems like. It's going to be a sort of coolish night tonight, said Bill casually. It certainly was. I don't remember chillier night in years. My teeth were chattering a little, from cold, before we turned in. I retired with all my clothes on, including my boots and leggings, and I wished I had brought along my earmuffs. I also buttoned my watch into my left-hand shirt pocket, the idea being, if for any reason I should conclude to move during the night, I would be fully equipped for travelling. The door would not stay closely shut. The door jamb had sagged a little, and the wind kept blowing the door ajar. But after a while, we dozed off. It was 1.27 a.m., when I woke with a violent start. I know this was the exact time, because that was when my watch stopped. I peered about me in the darkness. The door was wide open. I could tell that. Down on the floor there was a dragging, scuffling sound, and from almost beneath me a pair of small red eyes peered up phosphorescently. "'He's here!' I said to my companion as I emerged from my blankets, and he, waking instantly, seemed instinctively to know whom I meant. I used to wonder at the ease with which a cockroach can climb a perfectly smooth wall and run across the ceiling. I know now that to do this is the easiest thing in the world, if you have the proper incentive behind you. I had gone up one wall of the tent and crossed over, and was in the act of coming down the other side when Bill burst in, his eyes blurred with sleep, a lighted lamp in one hand and a gun in the other. I never was so disappointed in my life, because it wasn't a hydrophobic skunk at all. It was a pack rat, sometimes called a trade rat, paying us a visit. The pack or trade rat is also a denizen of the Grand Canyon. He is about four times as big as an ordinary rat and has an appetite to correspond. He sometimes invades your camp and makes free with your things, but he never steals anything outright. He merely trades with you, hence his name. He totes off a side of meat or a bushel of meal and brings a cactus stalk in. Or he will confiscate your saddlebag and leave you in exchange a nice dry chip. He is honest, but from what I can gather, he never gets badly stuck on a deal. Next morning, at breakfast, Johnny and Bill were doing a lot of laughing between them, over something or other. End of The Hydrophobic Skunk by Irvin S. Cobb Read by Lynn Thompson